Hi everyone, uh, welcome again. Uh, this is week 24. We're already 24 weeks into this uh, New Testament series and uh, week 24 as we continue our way through the New Testament. And uh, today, uh, or this week's readings are 1st and 2nd Peter, short books, 1st and 2nd Peter, and the book of Jude. Um, so I encourage you to read all three of those, but today in this, uh, in this video, I'm just going to focus in on 1st Peter and encourage you to kind of dig into that and the others. But 1st uh, Peter is a letter uh, written, actually commissioned by Peter the Apostle, uh, written down by uh, his co-worker uh, Silvanus. Uh, we get that right near the end of 1st Peter in chapter 5 in those closing verses. But Peter uh, commissions this letter and maybe uh, says it and speaks it to Silvanus. It's, it's really uh, meant for the early Christian church, uh, the Gentiles who are living in Asia Minor, and it's a letter that is circulated among many different churches, uh, but all Gentile Christians, new Christians, and uh, it's kind of modern day Turkey, and these people are being persecuted for their faith. They're living under the Roman government, and the Roman government uh, and Roman officials don't really, at this point in history, uh, like uh, any uh, what they consider to be foreign religions. Uh, they want you to bow down to Caesar and the emperor, and uh, Christians were refusing to do that, and so they were being persecuted for their faith. And uh, Peter writes this letter to remind them simply that uh, they have a new identity now, that they are people who have been chosen by God and um, given a new identity. They are to live out of that new identity, um, uh, really uh, acting in ways that will show those that are persecuting them uh, that there is a better way to live and a better way to be and a better God to follow. But they are being persecuted, and so Peter uses um, images from the Old Testament like Abraham and uh, Moses and the Israelites when they're in slavery in Egypt to uh, identify these new people as uh, not only brought into the, the holy family of God, but uh, maybe being ex uh, exiles or foreigners in a land because they are living now differently than what their culture would say. So uh, Peter jumps in and uses uh, images from the Old Testament. Abraham, when he was called to go to a foreign land, was a sojourner. Uh, Moses, when he was called to lead the people out of Egypt into a new promised land, those images are used throughout 1 Peter. Uh, but this, this letter um, is really a letter to say, hey, even amidst your suffering, even when you're being persecuted, stand firm because God is with you and God will bring you hope. And I see three major uh, points or major sections in 1 Peter. The first one is from chapter 1 after kind of an introductory uh, verses um, and greeting. Uh, chapter 1, verse 13 through chapter 2, verse 10. And that is simply reminding the people that they do have a new family identity, as I said, that God has now made them part of his holy family. And it's not just the Jews now that are part of God's chosen people, but even those uh, new Gentile Christians. Jesus came for all people. And uh, they're not leaving their land, but they're leaving their former ways. And so they are um, uh, considered to be uh, foreigners living differently, living lives of love and compassion and forgiveness. And in this first section, I'm going to read to you my favorite section of First Peter that really speaks to this new identity that they have in Jesus that Peter is reminding them of. And it's in chapter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10. Peter tells them, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10 says this, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You can see how that is giving them a new identity. Once they were no people, now they are God's people. They are now a holy nation. Great news to people who are going through suffering. 
uh, to say you have a new identity in Christ and Christ is with you through it. The second section uh, from chapter 2, verse 11, all the way through chapter 4, verse 11, is kind of a difficult section as you read through it. I'd be in, uh, in, uh, really love to invite your comments about that section. But it really tells them that they're suffering while it is terrible, while it is awful, while God does not want them to suffer. That they're suffering uh, and through that they can be witnesses of Jesus. Um, it can serve as a witness to Jesus Christ. And he reminds them that just as Jesus suffered, uh, so too their suffering can serve as a witness to Christ. And the way he does that is that uh, he knows they're living in this Roman society, a patriarchal society where there are masters and slaves. Sometimes the slaves are mistreated and they're suffering. And he talks about husbands and wives and sometimes husbands force their wives to worship the gods that uh, the husbands are worshiping in Rome, sometimes mistreating them. And Paul addresses those who are living as slaves and addresses those in families, particularly wives, to say, as a new person in Christ, uh, your actions can speak uh, very loudly. Instead of acting out of revenge, act out of love, act out of compassion, act out of forgiveness. And in so doing, you will uh, bring conversion to others uh, to this new way of being. And so there's a long section about, uh, about their suffering. And there's tensions about how they're living. I want to um, just read um, a section from, I think I'll do... Um, chapter 3. Let's take a look at chapter 3, uh, verses 13 through 16. It says, Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. And always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. You can see he's encouraging them, even amidst their suffering, uh, act in ways that are pleasing to God and always be ready to share your Christ story with others when they talk to you about what is this hope that is within you. There's a, another uh, major point in 1 Peter. And that is that even as you suffer, and even if you do suffer, and again, God does not want you to suffer, but if you do, you need to know that there is future hope in Christ. Again, he reminds them that Jesus suffered, but that he was raised up to new life. And so Peter reminds these people, these churches in Asia Minor who are going through persecution and suffering, that you can count it a joy uh, even when you suffer because it can be a witness and how you react to that. I want to read uh, a section here, uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing in Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. I know this is a tough theme and it's difficult to kind of wrap our brains around it, but Peter is encouraging them. Uh, even in their suffering. And as we look around our world today, we see that there's a lot of suffering, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. Many people suffering for proclaiming Jesus and proclaiming their faith. And Peter is reminding them and us to count it a joy and to rejoice because we are united with Christ. As I close, I want to read for you just a couple of passages from chapter 5. I think they are just wonderful verses and I don't want to uh, pass over them. Uh, chapter 5, um, and there's only five chapters in this letter. But Peter writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. In other words, God is going to exalt you. You can have your hope in Jesus even amidst difficulties. And then in verse 7, it says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 
Whatever it is you're going through, anxiety that you're feeling, Peter invites you to cast all of your anxiety on him because God loves you and God cares for you. Just a remarkable verse, one in which uh, maybe you should underline and memorize. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. And then he reminds them as he closes that they're battling not just against flesh and blood, but they're battling against evil forces, but that Jesus has won the victory over evil through his life, death, and resurrection. And so as I close, let me just end with this, in this wonderful uh, short letter from Peter. He says in chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. He reminds them that as Jesus was suffered and persecuted and then he was exalted, so too your hope, your future hope, it is sure, it is certain, and it is in Christ that he will exalt you uh, as well, just as he did in Christ. So be blessed as you read through 1 Peter and 2 Peter and the book of Job. And be blessed as you continue to read and dig into scripture and live it out. God is good all the time.